Hi everyone, my name is Trevor Jones and welcome back to the Astro Backyard. Tonight I'm going after a different type of astrophotography target, a Wolf Rayet star. These objects are known for their bubble-like shells of nebulosity, blown by the intense radiation and fast wind from the star. I've captured images of objects with Wolf Rayet stars in them before, but this one is special. This one was one of the first members of the class of stars that came to be called Wolf Wolf Rayet stars. And it's right there in the constellation Cygnus, just waiting for you to find it. I'm testing a new refractor telescope tonight, and I've got a few new image processing tricks to share with you as well. The forecast is cool and clear, and I feel like it's gonna be a great night. So please join me here in the Astro Backyard for another night of deep sky astrophotography as we capture the stunning Wolf Rayet 134. In my last video, I mentioned how I want to level up my personal astrophotography imaging game. Part of that goal involves going after new, tougher targets. I love shooting the Cygnus wall as much as the next guy, but it's time to move on. Wolf Ray at 134, or just WR-134, is one of those deep sky targets that's been hiding in plain sight. It sits between the well-known Crescent Nebula, which also contains a Wolf Rayet star, and the Tulip Nebula in Cygnus. The crazy thing is that I've actually noticed a glowing blue area of nebulosity in my wide field shots of the Cygnus region, but I just had no idea what it was. If you're using a planetarium app on your smartphone, like Stellarium or the Sky Atlas on the ASI Air, it's easy to miss this target. In fact, it almost doesn't exist. I had a heck of a time figuring out how I'm gonna align my telescope with this object without a proper designation for the target. I found the image overlay on the ASI Air Sky Atlas to be super helpful for this task. Even though WR-134 wasn't listed, I could see the faint blue glow of oxygen in that image overlay. So if you're hoping to shoot this target for yourself, this is where you need to point your telescope. You're welcome. As you can see, yet another telescope has entered the Astro Backyard. Not just another telescope, but another refractor. This one is here for testing from my old friend Steve, a local astronomy dealer here in Canada. And I agree, I use APO refractors too much on this channel, but at least this one's in a different size than I've ever used before. The Starfield Gear 115 has a focal length of about 800 millimeters or around 650 when the 0.8 reducer is used. My plan for this object is to capture the punchy details using narrowband HA and O3 filters, and this time also collect images in RGB for natural looking stars. I told you I wasn't messing around anymore. That means that this is a multi-night project involving several filters. These types of projects are a lot to take on and I have a few tips and tricks to share with you for projects like this a little later on. I mean, I don't expect to win an Astrobin image of the day with this project, but I can at least put in the amount of effort that those types of images require. WR-134 is a spectacular astrophotography target that is worth all of the effort. I've been drooling over all of the example images I've seen of it online. Okay, let's go over the equipment I'm using tonight for those looking to build a similar setup or just get an idea of what's possible with something like this. The camera is the ZWO ASI 2600mm Pro a workhorse of an astrophotography camera. It uses a monochrome APS-C sized sensor. Oh, that's funny. I was just about to talk about the filter wheel and it is not on there. Ready and... What do you think of that, mister? Okay, the filters in the filter wheel here in front of the camera are chroma, narrowband, and LRGB. There's seven filters in total in here. The narrowband ones are the three nanometer. As I mentioned, I'm using the Starfield 0.8 times reducer with the scope right now, as I will gladly take a faster F ratio and a wider field of view, at least for this project. The mount is the trusty ZWO AM5, and as you can see, I've got an odd looking 
counterweight situation going on here. The scope is actually way under the weight limits of the AM5 without a counterweight, but I threw these mini weights from the Star Adventure GTI on there just for peace of mind. It's still not balanced, but I guess that doesn't matter anymore on a strain wave mount. I know, the whole thing makes me question everything I've ever learned about astrophotography. Okay, it's starting to get dark out and it's almost time to polar align the telescope mount and get pointed at WR-134. At this time of year, this object is nearly straight up after it gets dark out and I'll likely start my imaging session with the scope on the way down after an early meridian flip. I know there are mixed opinions on Starlink and I'm all for accessibility to the internet. All I can say is that after seeing it for myself in the backyard for the first time, it's officially a part of my night sky, whether I like it or not. Okay, we're back in the garage now looking at all of the data I've collected on Wolf Ray at 134. So pretty exciting stuff here. If you look at my stack, in hydrogen alpha, just look at that beautiful wispy nebulosity. Here is what the O3 looks like, and these are basically just with an auto stretch in Pix and Sight. That's the state you're looking at them in here. And then I mentioned I was going to collect some broadband RGB stars as well, and that's what this looks like. So it's interesting to note in this image, there's basically no nebula. It's almost invisible. It's the same star field. Uh, and it's got those natural, colorful looking stars, which is the whole idea for this. Um, but it's very, very different than the narrowband data. So both of these images were captured with a monochrome 2600mm Pro camera and narrowband fil filters, the 3 nanometer uh, O3 and HA. And then this one was captured with no filter using a one-shot color camera. Because again, I was just going after the stars only. I'm not interested in separating that nebula. So we're going to attempt to align all of this stuff, which is, could be tricky if you plan on doing it manually. This is something historically I would do in Photoshop, but it was very time consuming. So I found a better way to do this in PixInsight. To make it extra challenging, as I said, this color RGB image was shot with a different camera, a different sensor size, so a slightly different image scale, and I'm sure there's some rotation in there as well. So. To handle this type of job, there's a tool in PixInsight called Star Alignment that works really, really well. So we go to Star Alignment and we need to choose our reference image. So our base image to kind of match everything up with. And for that, we're gonna choose our AJ. And then we're gonna add the files. These are the other images we want to align with it. 
So we'll choose the O3. And then we'll also choose our color stars layer. So these are all stacked images. And it's not that we're trying to combine them right now. We're just trying to align everything together so we can eventually build the image into channels. So all the, the settings here are left at the default. I'm sure there's a million different ways you could go about this, but I've found that the default settings here in PixInsight work pretty well. So we just need to choose our output directory and it looks like it's already where I want it to be. And then we want to run the global, apply global with a circle here. So it's gonna do its thing. It's going to um, do the scaling for us and it's gonna match these stars up with one another. So every frame is aligned with each other. Okay, so it's finished now and we just need to go to our output folder and take a look at the image it's done. So color stars are here. Okay, perfect. So this is the, this color layer for the RGB stars is now aligned and registered with our HA layer. So it's automatically been scaled and aligned with the HA layer. So if I click on that layer, we should notice that it's the same image scale. So look at this bright star to the upper right here. Boom, there it is. So when I lay these on top of each other, it's a perfect match. Very, very powerful stuff. And if we look at the other one that it did for us, the O3, now the O3 also lines up with it as well. You can see some overlap there where the image frame kind of shifted, uh, much less so than the RGB one. This is kind of a fail in terms of rotation. It was way off. So I'm gonna have to crop my image, but luckily this target's kind of nice in the center there. So now that they're all aligned with each other, we can do a channel combination to create our base layer, that HOO layer um, to bring into Photoshop. And I'll show you how to do that now. So we can close star alignment and go to channel combination. Channel combination. And so now we know that these files are aligned with each other. We can pick those versions and combine them. So for the red, we're gonna do the HA, say okay. And for the green, we'll do the freshly aligned O3. And for the blue, the freshly aligned O3. So this is the HOO palette. And we'll press the circle button here and look at just like that, we now have this perfectly combined aligned layer of WR134. Now this is just a starting point and I'm not going to combine the, the RGB star layer on here. We'll do that in Photoshop, but at least we have it scaled and aligned perfectly. So I can just pop that layer on top and then we'll be able to play with the amount of natural star color and that existing base layer of HOO underneath. Hopefully that was clear. This was a huge eye opener for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm someone that prefers to do as much as humanly possible in Adobe Photoshop, but I'm gradually doing more and more things in PixInsight, especially things like this, where this is really a huge time saver. And, and once you, you know, are able to do this, it's something you'll use time and time again. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting. Let's open up our HOO combined image. There it is there with the overlap and all. And now, because we use that star alignment tool, we can overlay our RGB stars, rotation and all. Uh, I'm just going to select all, copy, and I'm gonna paste it right on top here and it should align perfectly, which is so handy for the next steps we're gonna take uh, in terms of blending and revealing those stars underneath. Okay, so we've got our layers here, our boring RGB broadband layer on top and the HO underneath. So if we play with the opacity slider here, oh, that is so satisfying, look at that. So if you see what the stars by default look like in an HOO image, not very nice, right? Especially these red ones, they're just uh, so unnatural looking. But with this new RGB star layer on top, all of a sudden those, you know, warm stars actually appear nicely. So now it's gonna be a balancing act of keeping the stars in the image with those natural colors and then the punchy details of that nebula within it. So 
Uh, that's a challenge in its own, but getting to this point is a really uh, special place to be. And uh, it makes me very happy to see this. And I think this style of imaging, the RGB stars on an HO image, will work really, really well for a lot of the types of targets that I shoot, these emission nebulae with um, some oxygen in it. So I'm super excited to see how this turned out and I really hope that was useful to you. Thank you.